in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. My dear friends, if by now you are not doing everything for the God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light, today is the day to start. Today is the day to say yes to Jesus, to say yes to the one who is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes, Lord, from this moment, everything that I am and everything that I do past, present, and for all eternity, I offer for the glory of your, your Father's house. That offering is efficacious. That's what it means to have an intellect and a free will. I know I can do that. I know that. That's the use of my mind and a good use of it, too. And I have a free will. Knowing what I know, I can decide to say yes or no. I can decide to do this or that. I decide that everything is going to be given to Jesus. You know, even my past life, with all of its ups and downs, all of its miseries, all the pains and the aches that all of us experience, God's out of time, and so he's relevant to every time. And so we can go back in time and say, Lord, I give you the last 50 years, even the part that wasn't so good, because you're the God that transcends everything. You can bring good even out of evil. And so I give it all to you. I give it to you for the sake of the glory of our Father's house. That's a powerful way to live. You may say, but I'm poor, Father. I don't have anything to offer. I, I can't give anything to the poor. I, I, I really, I, I don't have a gift of speech. I can't teach. I can't preach. I, I really, I'm not strong enough to go and work in the soup kitchen. I'm getting old. And I, I my question to you, does your heart beat? Well, then offer him every beat of your heart. Listen, if it's still beaten, you can still be offering. So you offer him every beat of your heart, every breath you take, every word you speak, every step you walk, all that I am and all that I do, past, present, and for all eternity I can give to the Lord Jesus Christ who brings it to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's power to set captives free. And you are called to it because you are called to live the life of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And so we exercise our Christianity in a spirit of service. I remember my superior once told me very early in my priesthood, it might have been the, the day before I was ordained, the night before we stayed up all night in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, and he told me, always go as a servant. Always approach everything you do as a servant. Now, you know, servants do hard things and servants do dirty things. Servants are used to doing hard things and dirty things. And if a servant approaches everything he does as a servant, he's not very often disappointed. And he's not very often insulted. And he's not very often put out. And his peace is not very often disturbed. And so approach everything as a servant. And if they don't appreciate you, and if they don't give you your due, and if even you're used as a so-called doormat that people walk over, let me tell you something. God sees everything. And God will not leave anything without its reward. You cannot outdo the good God in generosity. Whatever you do, do it for the Lord, even if it's the tiniest thing. If it's done with love, God accepts it with infinite love. And so do little things with great love. 
and you will save souls. You will be an instrument of grace. You will be doing the work of the Redeemer. You will be a co-redeemer in Jesus, the one only Redeemer. We know that in this discussion of the moral law and law in general, we come to ecclesiastical law, church law. Now, the church has the power to make law under the power to bind and loose, which Jesus gave to Peter and to the, the authority in the church, the hierarchy of the church. That power to bind and loose includes three major areas. Number one, of course, sins, power to bind and loose sin, confession. Secondly, the power to define doctrine. And third, the power to require the following of rules, church discipline, precepts. You've heard of the precepts of the church. Well, number 2042 talks about the precepts of the church. You know what they are. You shall attend mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation. You shall confess your sins at least once a year. You shall humbly receive your Creator in Holy Communion, at least during the Easter season. You shall keep holy the days of obligation. You shall observe the prescribed days of fasting and abstinence. And we also have the duty, as best we can, to provide for the material needs of the Church in accordance with our abilities. Now, those are the, basically the precepts of the Church. They're binding in conscience. These aren't, these aren't uh, optional. Now, you might say, oh, the church, the church asks too much. Well, you know, why do I have to go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation? Well, listen, I, I, I believe that you probably would feed your body at least one good meal a week. And so not, why, not, why not feed your soul at least one good meal a week? The soul, after all, goes on for eternity. We're separated from the body for a while at least. And so the church doesn't try to take our freedom away or can't play golf on Sunday. Well, maybe you can after Mass. But give the Lord his due. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to the Lord what's the Lord. The church doesn't want to take our freedom away. Once again, the church wants to liberate our freedom. You know, you can't be happy unless you have the power to live your Christian and human life. And that power is not something you can simply generate on your own. If you could, you'd be God. And so you need to participate in God's power. You need to enter into God's own life. How do you do it? Through sanctifying grace. What's the preeminent way we receive sanctifying grace? By assisting at the Eucharist, by participating in the sacraments, every one of which cha channels to us sanctifying grace in a unique and precious mode. Moral life and missionary witness, the Catechism talks about. Very important. The fidelity of the baptized is a primordial condition for the proclamation of the gospel and for the church's mission in the world. Once again, this number, 2044 in the Catechism, in a certain way could well, it, I could say that this, this is what I've been trying to do for the last three years, at least, of my life. To try to get us, we, the baptized, to get us to live our baptism to its fullness. The answer to all the world's problems lies in this. The answer to the ecumenical crisis that we have to finally having one flock under one shepherd is in this, the fidelity of the baptized when you and I start living our Catholic Christian faith with intensity, we will attract others to the faith like moths to a flame. They will come when they see Jesus in you. And don't sit back and say, well, let them see Jesus in Father John. No, because I might say, well, let them see Jesus in, in Joe or Mary. I'm tired. It's hard to live the life of Christ. Let me come down off that cross for a while, Lord. Let them look at somebody else. No, every one of us has a responsibility to live our baptism, to live the life of Christ. 
Well, the fidelity that we exercise to our baptism, our, our consecration, to that degree that we're faithful to our baptism, to, the, that, to that degree will we be effective at spreading the kingdom. In order that the message of salvation can show forth the power of its truth and radiance before men, it must be authenticated by the witness of the life of Christians, the witness of a Christian life and good works done in a supernatural spirit have great power to draw men to the faith and to God. I used to get very upset about a lot of things in the world and even in the church. And my peace was always being disturbed. Oh, if that pastor would only do this, that, or the other thing. Oh, if that bishop would only straighten out that pastor. Oh, if that pastor would only straighten out sister. Oh, if sister would only straighten out that kid in the second row. On and on and on. I was always upset about those things. Every once in a while I still I slip up and it happens. But you know what? When I began to realize that the thing to do is to stop pointing that way and turn it around and point back this way and say, look here now. Father John is part of the problem, and he's not enough of the solution. The one who needs conversion is Father John. And when Father John is sufficiently converted and perfected and purified and made more like his master, then the sheep might recognize the master in Father John and listen to his voice. And then when we begin to think that way, we begin to have peace. We begin to think, all right, Lord, help me. You know, I can't convert you. I can't convert anyone. I have a terrible time trying to convert me. That's a full-time job. Not easy. Every day, every morning, I have to pray specifically for a lot of defects that I have. Well, God's not finished with me yet. He's working on me. But you know, when I, be, when I quit, complaining so much about everything wrong in the world and in the church and began to turn my gaze inward, I began to not only find myself, but I began to find God a little more easily. You and I both know there are many imperfect things in the church and in the world. We fail as individuals to live up to this noble calling we have. Now, there's nothing wrong with the indefectibly holy bride of Christ per se, but members of the church, plenty wrong with us. And so what can we do? You've got to do the same thing that St. Francis of Assisi did and that every saint did. Did St. Francis set out to convert the world to reform the church? No. St. Francis set out to reform himself. He set out to do penance for his sins. And in reforming himself, he ultimately reformed the whole church and through the church, the whole world. And you are called to do the same, and so am I. I'm giving you a principle, my friends, for peace. The peace that really means something in here. There is no peace out there. And if your peace in here is predicated upon the peace out there, you will never achieve peace peace in here, because you'll be up and down with the whims and fancies of the world. One day there will be a war, and then there will be a stock market crash. The next day there will be a plague, on and on and on. No, look within. There you will find God. There you will find yourself. Know thyself, Socrates used to say, and so too Jesus Christ would tell us. Look at your own imperfections. You've got to take the speck. You've got to take the plank out of your own eye before you can take the speck out of your brother's eye. We have all been guilty all too frequently of attempting to take the speck out of our brother's eye when we have a plank in our own. You and I are pretty lucky. You and I probably know pretty much what the church teaches. We have a gift. We have the sensus fidelium. 
We have a sense of the faith. We have a sense of the truth. God's given us eyes to see what's true. He's given us ears so that we can hear the beautiful, resonant, symphonic notes of truth. But very often, that's a good thing, but it can blind us. And in a certain kind of intellectual and spiritual pride, we can begin to tear down people who aren't so fortunate. You know, everything is grace. The faith is a gift. You know, sometimes we say, why can't they see it? You ever see a blind man crossing the street? And perhaps he, he goes a little the wrong way. Maybe he doesn't have a, a, a seeing eye dog or someone to help him. And maybe he starts wandering more into the traffic and, and everybody rushes. And if you're, you're the man who has to guide him, you might get upset and frustrated. You can't get mad at a man who's blind. My brothers and sisters, spiritual vision is a gift. Because your brother or your sister can't see it, don't get mad at them. You have the gift. Pray that they do, too. And so let's be very careful before we become rashly judgmental. But by the same token, do not fail to make rational judgments in the objective order. Call good and evil, truth and lies, by their proper name. Teacher, what must I do? Those words. Teacher, what must I do? In the response of the only one who's the teacher, Jesus, the commandments. And so we come into the section on the Ten Commandments. You have to acknowledge God. God alone is good. And then Jesus began to cite those commandments which relate to love of neighbor. Following Jesus Christ involves keeping the commandments. The law has not been abolished, but rather man is invited to rediscover it in the person of his master, who is its perfect fulfillment. Number 2053. Now that's enormously important. The law, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue has not been abolished. It's been fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In sacred scripture, the Decalogue is very much put forth by God. The word Decalogue literally means ten words. God revealed these ten words to his people on the holy mountain through Moses. Now we know what the Ten Commandments are. Although, you know, before I started doing this, about three, four years ago, when I would go around preaching, I, I was in a research mode. You know, I was working on my doctoral thesis, and, you know, you get in a certain research-type mode. And I, I was doing a little research, um, informal research, and as I'd go around preaching different parishes, I would give uh, some people a test sometime. Can you imagine? Some strange priest comes along in a parish mission and he gives you a test. And lo and behold, the majority of people failed the test. Now you might say, oh, Father, unfair now. After all, shame on you for giving the poor people, you know, a big old test in dogmatic theology. After all, we're not supposed to be theologians. Well, that's true enough. But the test went something like this. Name the Ten Commandments. Name the seven sacraments. What are the seven most common petitions prayed by Christians? What are the twelve articles of the faith? What is an angel? Are angels real? Simple things. Now, of course, I know everyone in this room could pass that test. <laughs> After all, we're big time. We're studying the catechism. So, when we come to the section on the Ten Commandments, obviously I know long ago we memorized the Ten Commandments, and unlike what one young man once said to me, well, Father, do I have to know them in order? <laughs> yes. There are ten of them, and they do go in an order. The fourth one is indeed that, the fourth, and so forth. In fidelity to Scripture, 
And in conformity with the example of Jesus, the tradition of the church has acknowledged the primordial importance and significance of the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. These commandments state what is required in the love of God and love of neighbor. Now, the first three commandments we know concern love of God, and the next seven concern love of neighbor. Now, they all go together. They're, they're related, they're compenetrated, you might say. They're inextricably united. The Council of Trent teaches that the Ten Commandments are obligatory for Christians, and the justified man, the justified man is still bound to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, the Second Vatican Council didn't do away with any of the teaching of the previous councils. It affirmed the teaching of the previous council, and in this case, too, the council teaches the bishops, successors of the apostles, receive from the Lord the mission of teaching all peoples and of preaching the gospel to every creature so that all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. The commandments observe always and in every way. No one has the authority to dispense from the Ten Commandments. It's immutable. It comes, it's rooted in the very law of God, which, as we said, is unchangeable. Those morals, that moral teaching contained in the Ten Commandments, that doesn't change from generation to generation. If it did, then it wouldn't be from God. It wouldn't subsist in God. Or maybe one would think, well, God changes. And once you say God changes, you've said God's imperfect. And then God wouldn't be God. And so the whole thing would collapse. The Decalogue forms a coherent whole. Each word refers to each of the others and to all of them. Now, why? I'll tell you why, because it's the truth. The truth is integral. The truth is univocal. The truth is perfectly and simply one. Why? Because the truth is God. And that's why the Ten Commandments are perfectly one, perfectly integral, perfectly univocal, because it's part of the simple, beautiful truth, which is not a something, but a somebody, God himself. And so, the Decalogue and the natural law, well, the Ten Commandments belong to God's revelation. And at the same time, they teach us about our true humanity. From the beginning, St. Irenaeus, Saint Irenaeus teaches us, from the beginning, God had implanted in the heart of man the precepts of the natural law. Then he was content to remind him of them. That's the Decalogue. So God places the natural law within our heart. Well, God, being perfectly wise, knows we need to be reminded, and that's the Ten Commandments, a reminder, divine revelation, a reminder of the basics of the natural law. Now, the commandments of the Decalogue are accessible to reason alone, but they have been revealed by God so that we can know them with certainty, without any admixture of error. Now, the obligation of the Decalogue, as I said, is absolutely imperative. Every human being. Apart from me, you can do nothing, God has told us. And so God tells us how we can move with him, how we can be in him so that we won't have to be apart from him, but in him. And the Ten Commandments help to show us how to do that. Now, do not think that we're saying that the Ten Commandments are all that is important, that after all, you know, this is a rigorous kind of religion, you just have to follow that, don't do this and don't do that and don't do the other thing. Now, very often, people give the Ten Commandments a bad rap and try to set up the Ten Commandments in juxtaposition against the law of love. Let me tell you something. If you love, you will willingly obey the Ten Commandments. They don't have to be imposed upon you. If your heart and mind are filled with that light, which is love, you will spontaneously to obey the Ten Commandments. If you love God above all things, and if you love your neighbor as yourself for the sake of love of God, then you will obey the Ten Commandments absolutely without any question, spontaneously and perfectly. 
to the degree we do not obey the Ten Commandments, to that degree we fail in love. That's a fact. And so there's no juxtaposition between law, commandments, and love. Love and law are one. Show me a person without law, and I'll show you a person without love. And don't give me that baloney that, well, love and do what you will. That's what St. Augustine said, and he mean it. And he meant it, but he knew what he meant. Very often we don't know what he meant. Love and do what you will. What it means is, yes, by all means love. And if you are in fact loving, you will always do the true and the good. But to the extent that you lack love, you will lack the capacity or the will to do the good and to do the true. Love and law are one, if indeed it is authentic law, law which is rooted in reason, right reason. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so the commandments help to bring us in to Jesus, help us to do his will. The Ten Commandments are going, we're going to talk about in the next several sessions. This afternoon, I'm going to begin with the first commandment, and I will probably go on quite at length on the first commandment. Actually, I could go on between now and December just on the first commandment. Actually, I could go on between now and doomsday <laughs> on the first commandment because the first commandment contains everything. You know, if we, if we really did worship the Lord our God, him only we would worship, if indeed we did love him with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole strength, our whole soul, if we did that, that encompasses everything. That would encompass the other nine commandments. That would dispose us to receive the sacraments. If we were living those commandments perfectly and with perfect love, we'd be well disposed. We'd receive the Eucharist once, become saints, get on the elevator, go straight up. No stops. If we can truly live this commandment with perfection, all of the others fall into place. If we could only love the Lord our God, with all of our heart and all of our soul. We'd be so happy if we could do that. You know, we're, God created us for happiness. God created us for beatitude, and that's what beatitude means, but not a mere worldly kind of happiness, a, a happiness that transcends the transient joys of this life. God wants us to be happy. And you know, the only way we can be happy is by loving the Lord with our whole heart. St. Augustine said, our, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. And that's true. If we would <clears throat> spend the rest of our lives praying to the Lord that we would be given the grace to love him, as many of the saints prayed for that, O Lord, help me, a sinner, help me to love you. I have to ask God that. I, <clears throat> For years, you know, I used to think these wonderful, pious people who had these great devotional feelings of love of God, and I, I used to envy that so much because I didn't have those feelings. You know, I, I, I wanted to love God, but I didn't feel. You know, there, you ever have that dilemma in your life? You, you don't have those feelings, but I, Father, I don't know... I, I used to think maybe I'm reprobate because I don't have feelings. I don't have these nice, soft, uh, fuzzy feelings very often, every once in a while. What a revelation when I found out that loving God isn't a question of feelings. It's not a question of mere emotion. Oh, sometimes we have that, and, and that's fine. That's wonderful. Love is a decision. Love's an act of the will. If I'm to love the Lord my God with my whole heart, mind, strength, soul, that's a decision I have to make. You married people know that. <laughs> right? I mean, let's face it, pretty quick the honeymoon's over, and then love becomes a real act of the will. That's a decision. On a given day, you know, I mean, how many days... Do you wake up and look at your spouse and, and 
say, oh, my dear, most beloved spouse, I love you with all my heart and all my... <clears throat> I guess there might be a few people who do that, and that's wonderful. I'm not making fun of it. That's great. But you are, you are fortunate. On some days, we don't feel that. But what do we do? Well, we still love them. We make a decision. We want to. We will it. That's what love is about. Love is principally in the will. Love is a decision, an act of the will. And so to love God is not just feelings. How, I can't count the number of times people have come to me in tears. Good people, holy people, wonderful people. Oh, Father, I, 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 a lot of my good friends are religious sisters. I give spiritual direction to a lot of Carmelite nuns, contemplative nuns, right? All they do is pray. It's their whole life. They're in love. They're espoused to Christ. And how often they tell me, oh, Father, I, I, don't, I don't have any devotion. I have no feelings of love of God. A wonderful friend of mine that I do, prob no doubt, a very poor job. She probably should be directing me. But in her humility, um, she asked me to be her spiritual director. Now, <clears throat> this woman was a holy and good person before I was ever born. And, but often she'll say, Father, I just I don't feel I love God. And, you know, but I tell her, well, sister, you know better than I do. It's not a feeling. You don't feel that you love God. Oh, you know you love God. You've been there more than 50 years profess living as a bride of Christ. And so I know very well that you love God. You decided to love God, and you've remained faithful to that. So love is a decision. The first commandment really is a manifestation of that great assertion that love is repaid by love alone. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's God's first call and his just demand that man accept the one true God and that man worship and love that one God. Man's vocation, man's call, is to, to make manifest by acting in conformity with his creation this God in whose image he is created. The first commandment, embraces faith, hope, and charity. When we say the word God, we confess a constant, unchangeable being, always the same, faithful, just, without any evil. It follows that we must necessarily accept his words and have complete faith in him and acknowledge his authority. He is almighty, merciful, and infinitely beneficent. Who could not place all hope in him? Who could not love him when contemplating the treasures of goodness and love he has poured out upon us? So teaches number 2086 in the Catechism. <clears throat> Listen, if you don't trust God, who are you going to trust? He's all-powerful, otherwise he couldn't be God. His very nature, his essence, is love. God is love, St. John tells us in his Gospel. And so if God is all-powerful, if God is love, if God is mercy, we know that he is, then why not trust that God? And you say, oh, but I, I trust that God. <clears throat> well, then why are you always worried? And why am I always worried about this, that, and the other thing? Oh, I worry about so many things. Worry about my health. Worry about the ministry. Worry about financial things. Worry about all kinds of things. Why worry? Jesus told us, don't worry. Today has problems enough of its own. Don't, don't worry about tomorrow. God, your Father, will take care of you. And so we are called to trust God. If you love him with your whole heart, mind, and strength, of course, you're going to trust him. Now, you and I know that's easier said than done. But we have to, we have to make a try at it anyhow. Faith, hope, and charity. 
the theological virtues infused at baptism, they're embraced in this first commandment. Our moral life has its source in faith in God, who reveals his love to us. St. Paul speaks of the obedience of faith as our first obligation. He shows that ignorance of God is the principle and explanation of all moral deviation. Our duty towards God is to believe in him and to bear witness to him. Now, in an earlier class, we spoke about the theological virtue of faith. We talked about the faith. We talked about the subjective and the objective dimensions of faith. We gave a definition of faith. Now, you lucked out, by the way, a little side note here. I, we're not going to give you a final examination. Uh, people have been asking about that. Oh, Father, you're going to give us an exam. Uh, well, no. But if I were to give you an exam, <laughs> and I could only ask you one question, I might ask you, what is faith? Now, you could tell me that, of course. Now, if I were to just point at someone here, I know that any one of you could stand up and face the camera and give us for the entire universal church a perfect definition of the theological virtue of faith. I'm so certain that you could do that that I won't even ask you to do it. It's so simple. <laughs> but basically, you know that the theological virtue of faith has three essential elements. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, and believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief because he is truth itself. We believe we have faith, not because it's plausible, but because God has revealed it. Why do I believe everything the Catholic Church teaches? Because it's all plausible? Well, it is perfectly in accord with reason, but my beady little brain can't figure that out. I believe it because of God who's revealed it, not because it's plausible. Do you think I can explain the Trinity? Nobody can. I mean, we can say certain things, but we can't perfectly, rationally set out a, a full exposition on mystery. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. Our moral life has its source in this faith. The first commandment requires us to nourish and protect our faith with prudence and vigilance. I'm going to say that again. The first commandment requires us to nourish, to nourish and protect our faith. Hear that? Nourish it and protect it. Both those things. Nourish it, protect it. Not just for yourself, for your family. I had a letter from a man someplace in New York this week. As people often do, he gave me a litany of all the bad things that he has to put up with where he is. And he told me that he's going to move his entire family, maybe here, and <laughs> because he knows we're doing this. But you see, that man, now I'm not saying that's the answer. You, 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 know, you, can't, you can't run necessarily from problems, but I sympathize with that. Uh, his children, his family are subjected to things that aren't healthy. That man is a good father. He's a good, he's a good spouse. He doesn't want his children and his wife to be subjected to that kind of insidious false teaching, immorality that masquerades as being updated morality. He doesn't like that. It makes him sick. And he doesn't want his family subjected to that. How come? Well, I think he's living his faith. What's it say here? The first commandment, you don't even have to go the second, third, or seventh. The first requires us to nourish and protect, protect, protect our faith with prudence and vigilance and to reject everything that is opposed to it. There are various ways of sinning against faith. 
For the life of me, I can't figure out why people, many people, have a hard time understanding why I just can't stomach bad teaching. I'll tell you why. Because prudence dictates that you have to nourish your faith and protect your faith. You nourish your faith with good, substantive teaching, truth. You do not poison your faith, subvert your faith, erode your faith, or destroy your faith with phony doctrine and immoral morality. That's prudence, and that's protecting your faith. And we have to be prudent, and we must protect our faith. My friends in the Old West have a saying, they're ranchers, and they say, if you soak in a tub of manure long enough, you might come out smelling funny, partner. <laughs> you get my drift. And so, no matter how smart you are, no matter how well-educated you are, no matter how holy you are, do not presume that if you sit day in and day out, year after year after year, in an environment where there is bad teaching going on, that you will not be affected by it. I've seen perfectly good religious and perfectly good seminarians destroyed by just such things. I don't like to talk about these things. I certainly don't want to emphasize these things, but I have to advert to these things, make reference to these things, because these things are a matter of life or death. And if you don't know about this, and I think you people do, then you've got to be aware of it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be preoccupied with it. Don't get trench warfare mentality, them and us, you know, how that goes. Don't get that. Be loving, be kind, be open, but remember this. There's a difference between tolerance and permissiveness. They are two very different things. We are to be tolerant, but not permissive. Everything under the sun isn't okay, even though God does send his reign upon the good and the evil. We are not to compromise with evil. We are to be loving towards all people. We are to love every sinner. I don't care how bad the sinner. I don't care which drug addict, murderer, or prostitute. You better love him with the love of Jesus Christ. And I don't care how horrible he or she is. We've got to love them with the love of the Lord. But I don't have to love the sin that's destroying them. That I don't love. That I hate. And I fight it. Why? Because I love the person and I want them liberated from the oppression of that sin. So faith is encompassed in the first commandment. Now, there are ways to sin against faith. How can we sin against faith? Well, number one, doubt. First one that the catechism lists, number 2088, doubt about the faith. Voluntary doubt about the faith disregards or refuses to hold as true what God has revealed and the church proposes for belief. An example, you say, all right? I could give you several dozen, but we'll settle for a couple. How about the person who says, oh, well, the Eucharist is just a sign of Jesus. Jesus isn't really, truly, and substantially present there. I doubt that's true. Then you sin against faith. It says so right here. You can sin against faith by voluntary doubt, disregard, or refuse to hold this true what God has revealed and the church proposes for our belief. The substantial real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, the assumption, the trinity, the necessity of confession of serious sins, all kinds of things, all those elements of the doctrine of the faith, to voluntarily doubt those things, to disregard them, to refuse to hold them as true, that is a way of sinning against faith. It's a sin against the first commandment. Involuntary doubt 
refers to hesitation in believing, difficulty in overcoming objections connected with the faith, or also anxiety arise, aroused by its obscurity. If this involuntary doubt is deliberately cultivated, doubt can lead to spiritual blindness. Listen, a thousand times a thousand difficulties don't make a single doubt. You and I might struggle with certain things in our faith. You, might, you and I might say, well, I wonder how this can be. Well, let me see if I can work this out. Let me try to understand it as best I can. We have difficulties, but all those difficulties don't make a single doubt. I may wrestle with the rational reasons for my faith, trying to understand better, but I don't doubt any of it. Remember, there's a difference between faith and understanding. The two are compatible, but they're not the same thing. I don't understand it all, and I've studied it a lot more than most of you. I do not purport to understand our faith perfectly. I would have to be God himself to understand perfectly our faith because the essence of our faith is God, and only God fully fathoms God. And so we walk by faith, not by sight, but we do use our mind to understand what we first give the assent of faith to. Incredulity is the neglect of revealed truth or the willful refusal to assent to it. Heresy, here's a good definition. If you ever wondered what heresy is? Heresy is the obstinate post-baptismal denial of some truth which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. Or it is likewise an obstinate doubt concerning the same. Heresy can be an obstinate doubt concerning some truth which must be believed. The real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, the infallibility of the Holy Father and the bishops united to him, an obstinate doubt about any one of those things, it says it, can constitute heresy. You don't want to fall into that category. You know, I want to tell you something straight out. There are many people, many people in the church today, some of whom teach in Catholic universities and seminaries, some who should know better who fall into this category, an obstinate post-baptismal denial or an obstinate doubt about some element of the doctrine of the faith. That's heresy. And do you know what the, if you have knowledge of it, you know what the result of heresy is? I hate to say the word, but it needs to be said at times, rarely. Excommunication is the immediate result when you have knowledge that that's the penalty of heresy. In other words, if I were to take the position, look, I just don't believe that the Blessed Virgin Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her only son. I just can't buy that. I don't believe it or I have an obstinate doubt. By definition, that's heresy. And I run the risk of separating myself from the body of Christ. You know what happens when someone does that? They step out of the light into the darkness. They're cut off from the body of Christ. And what often happens? They keep on teaching. And they go from bad to worse. The deceived, deceiving others, the blind, leading the blind. What happens? Both of them fall into a pit, just like Scripture says. And that goes a long way towards explaining what goes on very often. It's no big mystery. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. There are a lot of people who should quite simply be talking about assent rather than dissent to church teaching today. Apostasy is the total repudiation of the Christian faith. Schism, that's the refusal of submission to the Roman pontiff 
or of communion with the members of the church who are subject to him. These are all sins against faith. These are all sins against the first commandment. Now hope, that theological virtue of hope, also is part of this first commandment. When God reveals himself and calls him, man cannot fully respond to the divine love by his own powers. He must hope that God will give him the capacity to love him in return and to act in conformity with the commandments of charity. Hope is the confident expectation of divine blessing and the beatific vision of God. It is also the fear of offending God's love and of, encourage, of incurring punishment. We confidently expect God's blessing. We confidently expect that God will give us the means of achieving our supernatural end, which is the beatific vision, to be with him forever. You have to hope. After all, he's a good God, he's a loving God, he's a merciful God, and so we should hope in God. That's a theological virtue. You know, hope does spring eternal in the human heart, and when you start to lose hope, everything turns dark. You know, I've been in some pretty bad spots in my life. I've been down and thought I was out. But so long as there's a glimmer of hope, you can take the next step. You have the strength to put up with it for one more moment. So long as there's hope, you've got life, you've got a chance. And God breathes that hope through the power of his Holy Spirit into the human heart. The first commandment is also concerned with sins against hope, namely despair and presumption. Those sins against hope are often called sins against the Holy Spirit. You don't want to sin against hope because you're sinning against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us life. He's the Lord and giver of life. Where the Holy Spirit is there, there is life. Where the Holy Spirit is there, there is hope. Don't sin against hope. Don't sin against the Holy Spirit. Don't fall into despair. Don't go into presumption. By despair, man ceases to hope for his personal salvation for God, from God, for help in attaining it or the forgiveness of his sins. Despair is, a, in a sense, a veiled form of pride. My sins are bigger than God's mercy is what we really say when we go into despair. Oh, God couldn't forgive me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm cursed. I'm as good as in hell. Nothing can save me. I've been living in sin for 50 years. After all, my sins are scarlet. If your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so we trust in God's mercy. Why? Because God's mercy is bigger than our sins. If you took all the sins from the first to the last, beginning to end, condensed them, distilled them, and synthesized them, yet would they be less than a drop? In the infinite ocean of God's mercy, which transcends all sin. And so we don't despair. Despair is contrary to God's goodness, to his justice. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful to his promises. And he has promised us that if we repent and if we believe in the gospel, if we live a holy life, he forgives us. Listen, if you've been in sin for 50, 60 years, and I don't care if you're Hitler and Stalin, and every murderer and rapist all rolled into one. And you go before the Lord, and you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Truly repenting in your heart. God will forgive you in that instant. And let me tell you something, you don't have to chase him down. He's been chasing you like the hound of heaven all your life. And so wake up and realize it. Don't go into despair. Despair is one of the devil's main tools, especially today. You know how it is when you sin. After you sin, 
the devil starts working on you, you say, well, throw in the towel. Now you've done it. You're finished. It's just the opposite of the way he talks before. Bishop Sheen used to talk about that. You know, before we sin, the evil one is always saying, oh, come on, everybody else is doing it. It's not so bad. Try it. You'll like it. We are sophisticated people. What does God care about morality anyway? After all, he's, he's, all, he's way out there, and you're here. So go ahead. It's no big deal. And so then you fall, and then you do it. Instantly, he's on you, and he's, aha, you no good so-and-so. You see what you did? Oh, you're rotten. Look what you've done. You're so miserable. There's no hope for you. No hope at all. You're finished. You might as well go all the way. Kill yourself. Be a prostitute. Take drugs, whatever. Finish yourself off. There's no hope. Despair. Well, don't fall into despair. But don't go to the other extreme and go to presumption. There are two kinds of presumption. Either a man presumes upon his own capacities, hoping that he can save himself without help from on high. That's the old heresy of Pelagianism, thinking we can save ourselves through our own natural goodness. Or he presumes upon God's almighty power or his mercy, hoping to obtain his forgiveness without conversion and glory without merit. Now, that's another common one today. Oh, a lot of people presume upon God's mercy and goodness. God doesn't care. God will forgive you. Of course he will. A true statement. No matter what. Yes, God forgives every sin. And so then they use it as a shield for vice. And they go on sinning. Oh, God's merciful, God's loving, so keep on committing adultery and keep on doing this and that and the other thing. God doesn't mind. God forgives you. The devil loves it. He loves it. You've got to know where the lines are. Someone told me, one of my collaborators in my ministry said, you've got to write a book, and the title of it has to be, you've got to know where the lines are. I'm always talking about that. You've got to know where the lines are. Yes, of course. God forgives you. Of course, God holds out his mercy to you no matter what. But can you receive mercy without repentance? No, you cannot. Is God's mercy there for you? Yes, God's mercy is there for everyone. But what's the condition? The condition is saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, give me your mercy. I want it. You have to desire God's mercy. That's called contrition. Sorrow for your sins. And what does that include? A firm purpose of amendment. And so, like the person who once said to me, well, Father, I've been living in sin, and, you know, I live with my girlfriend, and, well, you know, that's my sin. I said, okay, well, you're, I'm, you're a brave man. Wonderful. Make a confession like that when you're moving out. Huh? <laughs> Thought the only thing I had to do is say, hey, I, you know, I'm living in sin, then, you know, my sins are forgiven. No. no. Firm purpose of amendment is an integral part of contrition. No firm purpose of amendment, no contrition, no contrition, no absolution. Why? Because God's not merciful? No, because you're not merciful on yourself. And so accept God's mercy. It's there waiting for you, but don't presume upon God's mercy. Presumption is a sin against hope, and it is a sin against 